Hello there, and welcome to a map of Greenville, South Carolina. Now, Greenville is a lovely town, but I would say it's not particularly notable for most things. But to me, it's very notable, because I have a very special memory there of seven years ago seeing my very first total eclipse. And that is an event I'm trying to recreate. Seven years later, it is 2024, it is time for another total eclipse here in the US. And I want to work out what made that trip such a good long weekend and try and recreate it and document it here. So let's talk about some of the elements of that weekend. First of all, totality. I have to say that partial eclipses are a little bit interesting, they're fun. Experiencing totality is like nothing else. It is ethereal, it is unnatural, it is unnerving. I still have a strong memory of it from seven years ago. Like those two and a half minutes, whatever, I can still remember clear as day. I am desperate to get that again. And so that's kind of the crux of this trip, is seeing totality. But there are other elements too. First of all, I went somewhere that I would never otherwise normally go. Greenville is a pretty average town city in the US. And I kind of like that. Often when I'm in a place with a good train system, I'll land, get on a train, and just take the train to the end of the line, see what's there, see a place that tourists wouldn't normally go. And I got that in Greenville. I also saw a national park when I was there. I have a personal goal to see all 62 titled national parks. And Congaree National Park is in South Carolina, about I think, a two hour drive away from Greenville. And so in that four day weekend, I managed to cram in a trip to Congaree National Park, which is, there's a lot of swamp, a lot of spiders, very interesting. Uh, not sure it's particularly unique, but I definitely enjoyed my time there. I got to go visit Greenville, which I just, saw the eclipse and also met a lot of locals, sat in a lovely park, shared some snacks. It was just a great little community event. And finally, ate a lot of Carolina barbecue and went back on the plane significantly heavier. But the point is, it was a great package experience. And so now, seven years later, I'm kind of standing here and asking myself, in some ways, the same question. And that question is, what's the best place to see a total eclipse? Now, as you can see here, got a lot of options. The path this time cuts through some of the most populated parts of the US. And so I want to go and sort of filter through the path with those criteria I just kind of outline and try and come up with some candidates and then pick one and go to it. So if we look at the actual path in a little bit closer detail here, you can see that it starts down here in Texas, goes through a lot of sort of the Midwest, Northeast of the US and ends up there in Maine. Now, there are about 35 million people, approximately, that live under this path. It is very populous. I have a lot of average or normal cities and towns I could go to. So I have to be a little bit more picky in where I go and what I do here. So let's start down here at the beginning of the path and see what the options look like. So if we zoom in to Texas through to Arkansas here, you'll see that there's obviously a lot of major metro areas in Texas. Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas are all on the path. I've been to Dallas. I've been to Austin. Austin's lovely. I'll stop there. Nothing about Dallas. Um, and I've not been to much else of this part of the world, apart from Houston. Also not great. Um, but if we overlay the number of national parks here, Texas doesn't have very many. In fact, it only has two. I've been to one of them this year, Guadalupe Mountains, this, this winter. But Big Bend here is the other one. And Big Bend, San Antonio, that's quite a drive. Don't really fancy that, especially given the amount of traffic that's gonna be around this particular weekend. And also, I kinda of wanna see Big Bend with its sister park, the other side of the Mexican border. So I'm gonna kind of rule that one out. However, if we look at Little Rock, it's very close to Hot Springs National Park. And here you've got a very powerful combination. A city I probably otherwise wouldn't go to in, in Little Rock in Arkansas, and a national park very close to it, also on the path of totality, which is an unusual one. And so that definitely earns an initial sort of interesting star in my mind. There is one more national park along sort of this part of the arc. It is just off totality up there in St. Louis. It is Gateway Arch National Park. I do not consider Gateway Arch to be a real national park. It should be a national monument, we'll continue. I will go there, it counts, it ends in national park. It does not count for this trip, it's not enough. So moving up here to sort of the Midwest through to upstate New York, um, again, we've got some pretty major metropolitan areas. Indianapolis I've not been to, 
but I'm probably going to go to the Indy 500 at some point, so I'll already be going there. Cleveland I've been to, it's lovely, but I've already been there. Rochester up in New York, I have a specific culinary reason to go there in the future. And again, if we overlay the national parks in this area, you'll see there's not a lot of them around here. Indiana Dunes up here on the sort of lake shore is interesting, but it's very, very far from the natural path of totality. And honestly, it's closer to all the sun over here than it is to Indianapolis itself. I will say that Cuyahoga Valley is very close to Cleveland. That could be a powerful combination and is a good fallback option if I don't find anything else. Again, I do like Cleveland. I've been there before, but like, I can find a place around it and it's, it's honestly quite a nice place to go for a small to medium-sized American city. But let's go further along the path, even further to the northeast here. As we come up to this part of the US, there isn't much here. The last major city along the arc here is Burlington, Vermont. And Burlington's interesting, I definitely consider it. And you know, Vermont's nice and wintry, so that's fun. But if we overlay the national parks, there's only one of those in the northeast. And that is Acadia National Park over there on the main coastline. And, well, I've always wanted to go to Acadia. It's one of those things where that rugged North Atlantic coastline that, like, the main coastline has, I've never been there in the US, but I've been to the same kind of place a lot in the UK and Ireland. It is incredibly evocative of home for me. And so I've always wanted to go see it this side of the pond. But unfortunately, if you look, it seems like Acadia just isn't near anything that's useful. That is, until you zoom in. Because when I went looking a little bit closer, I was like, oh, right there on the border of Canada is a small town called Halton in Maine. And Halton is very interesting. It calls itself the end of the road. Because it is. It's the very last town in America. The Canadian border is right next to it. And there's really not much else in that part of the US. It's very rural around there if you look on the satellite or maps views. And so as soon as I saw this combination, I was sold. Here is a national park I've always wanted to go to in an environment I've always wanted to see, the main coastline, along with a small town I otherwise would never normally go to that is a little bit notable in itself, but also when I went to the website, they were doing a small eclipse festival, they clearly had a little bit of a sense of humor. I was like, great, that seems like the place I want to go. So that's the plan. Let's go and have a long weekend, go and see Acadia and the main coastline, and go and see Holton and see the eclipse in Holton itself. Now, getting over there, it's a little bit of a challenge. From Denver, it's not an easy trip, but I'll go through those details as I travel. So for now, let's head off to the airport. So, as I drive to the airport, let's talk flights. Holton does have an airport, but it's a tiny general aviation airport. And besides, it only has two hotels, so I'm actually staying further south, in the town of Bangor, between Holton and Acadia. Bangor has a decent airport with scheduled commercial flights, but they only really go to Philadelphia or New York, and the connection timing from Denver just isn't great. Looking further down the coast, Portland has direct flights from Denver in the summer, and April is definitely not the summer. That leaves Boston as the closest airport with a direct flight, and crucially, it's also a city I've always wanted to visit. It was decided then, I went for a 9am flight out of Denver, giving me a whole afternoon to see a little bit of Boston before I drove up north the next morning. When I got to the airport, it turned out that my gate was right at the end of the concourse, but the flight boarded on time, and there was only a small delay at pushback. Three and a half hours, lots of landscape, and several podcasts later, we touched down in Boston, and went to pick up my rental car, and immediately ended up in traffic. So, after a little bit of choosing, I eventually picked a Ford SUV something, not quite sure what this is, but crucially, feels pretty nice, has wireless Android Auto, has adaptive cruise control, so I'm happy about those things. Uh, right now, I am in fact stuck in a lot of traffic in the Boston Logan Airport. It feels, I'm gonna say significantly worse than it should be based on just the road design, so, Going to try and get through this and out onto the roads of Boston and see what we can do. It turned out that an overheight truck had managed to wedge itself in the tunnel that goes between the airport and Boston proper. And so after an hour, I eventually found my way to the now freed tunnel and drove over into Boston and then across to my hotel. It's on the outskirts of Boston. It's not too far away. It's in a place called Medford. Uh, but crucially, it has two things. It has free parking, 
very hard to find in Boston hotels, so you see why I'm on the outskirts a little bit now. And secondly, it has a train station about 200 meters away. So I don't have to deal with driving or traffic anymore today. I can go and approach Boston in the proper fashion, which I'm led to believe is on public transport. So I'm gonna go wander over to the T, uh, try it out. I'm always curious what allegedly good public transport in America is, and the T allegedly is good, so we'll see. And then head downtown and try and find some good food. I embarked on my journey into the center of Boston on what it turns out is a very reasonable metro system, and then walked around a little to get a feel for some of the architecture and the rare non-grid aligned layout of the city before going to find a good burger, and found a rather excellent one at the Boston Burger Company. Full of burger and with the light fading, I took the tea a few stops back towards my hotel, had a bit more of a wander around, ending up in the North End, where I couldn't resist picking up a few sweet treats before heading back to my hotel to get some sleep. Well, good morning and welcome to day two. It is uh, quite gray and dreary out there. Uh, certainly what I expect from New England in the spring. Now the forecast, fingers crossed, still looks good for clear skies on Monday, so we'll see. I may have totally lucked out here. Um, but either way, I'm still gonna enjoy the drive up north today. That drive north was around four hours and mostly through Massachusetts and then Maine. But if you look closely between them, there's a small slice of New Hampshire that comes out to the coast. Now, while it's a goal of mine to visit every state, I don't consider that I visited one unless I've either eaten or slept there. And so, given the chance, I decided to stop for a late breakfast in the town of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and add it to my list. It was definitely a very wet drive, and there was still a bit of snow on the ground, but after an hour or so of driving, I found myself in Portsmouth, and after a fun drive over a working, proper virtual lift bridge, I stopped at a local bakery for a breakfast sandwich. I got back in the car and continued my journey north. The weather getting slightly better as I went, and the snow levels definitely increasing, but the surroundings continue to just be a generic American freeway. The coastal route is definitely prettier, but adds a couple more hours. I opted to do that on the return journey. Finally, after a long drive, I made it to Bangor, my hotel for the next few nights. Given the weather, not going to do much else tonight. I was going to maybe go see some monuments and stuff, but it's going to be better weather tomorrow, even better on Monday for the eclipse. So instead, I'm just going to have an early relaxing night, go get some drinks and snacks from a supermarket, go find a spot of dinner, and then turn in. And then tomorrow, it's time to go see Acadia National Park. So I will see you bright and early for that. Acadia is located on Mount Desert Island, around an hour south of Bangor, and is a set of different areas of the island, as well as some outlying islands, all joined together into one park. The town of Bar Harbor while not in the park itself, is the center of activity on the island. And so I drove there first to visit the Winter National Park Visitor Center before driving down into the park itself. I classify most national parks into two categories. There are those parks that are spectacularly unique or have beauty that you find almost nowhere else, like White Sands or the Grand Canyon. And then there are those that are just nice, well looked after examples of a much larger geographic region. My local Rocky Mountains National Park is one such example, and Acadia is another. Even out of season, it's very pretty. A prime example of the rugged Atlantic coastline I come here to see, with some absolutely lovely mountain lakes in the interior. Further around the island, you find some proper cliffs and a lighthouse, and a notably broken natural seawall. What's also noticeable, though, is the sheer level of tourist infrastructure. The park has an entirely separate one-way road system. There's traffic management everywhere, and almost every business I passed on the drive down from Bangor and on the island itself had signs saying they were closed for the winter. This seems like the sort of park that gets absolutely packed every summer just because it's a national park. Yet, I went another half an hour down the coast and it was just as pretty there. In my time talking to the locals in Maine, it's clear that there's a torn identity between being the vacation playground for the rest of the Northeast and just being a place people live and enjoy. It's a shame. It's an incredibly beautiful part of the world, even in winter, but the economy relies so heavily on tourism that the peak of the COVID pandemic almost broke them. I definitely want to come back and see the coastline in the summer or autumn, but I suspect I won't want to go to Acadia itself, and instead visit the many smaller peninsulas and islands. After all, there's nothing that puts a damper on natural beauty quite as much as sitting in a traffic jam to go see it. Traffic was on my mind the next day as well. The drive from Bangor to Halton is normally two hours, but given the rural road network and the uncertain amount of traffic expected for the eclipse, I opted to leave six hours before totality began, 
giving me plenty of time to make it and get settled. While traffic was definitely heavier than I'd seen in previous days, it flowed fine, and I got to Halton with four full hours to spare. A quick drive around the centre of town showed that parking was still plentiful and the Eclipse Festival was only just getting underway. Rather than sit and wait for four hours, I decided to go and fill the time with one more interesting location. Just across the border in Canada, in the town of Heartland, is the world's longest covered bridge, something you wouldn't make a trip just to see, but which now provided an excellent way to spend some time. Plus, it was still on the path of totality, so I wasn't risking missing the eclipse. I crossed into Canada after a slightly bemused border guard asked why I was entering, and drove the 20 minutes over to Heartland. I have to give it this. The bridge was significantly longer than I was expecting, though also just a single lane wide. I parked at the east end of the bridge to get a better look and admire the size of the thing, spotted a Starlink in a rather unusual location, and then got back on the road to return to Holton, with the US border guard being equally bemused by me having spent only 45 minutes in Canada just to see a bridge. Holton is normally a town of only 6,000 people, but today it was thriving. Having been to two now, eclipses have a very odd effect on a town. An event that will never happen again in anyone's lifetime is thrust upon a set of places no one would ever normally consider visiting. Some towns just shrug and try to control traffic, and some, like Holton, go all in. There were stands, bands, and every business in the town flung open its doors. Both NASA and a ton of TV stations had turned up. I counted at least six different news crews. Equipped with some delicious snacks baked by the local Humane Society, I found a nice spot in a park by the water. I wanted somewhere to sit down and chat to people, as well as wanting to call back to the spot I found in Greenville seven years ago. With solar eclipse glasses I've kept for the last seven years, I sat back and waited for the event, chatting to some locals and, of course, meeting some good dogs. The first stages of an eclipse are slow. There's a change in the tone of the light, a slight chill, but nothing you wouldn't notice by itself. As the moon slowly covers the sun, though, the light dims, the sky begins to turn the wrong colour, and then, eventually, the last glimpses of light flash through the moon's craters as totality begins. I opened with a question. Where is the best place to see an eclipse? And I think in reality, there's two parts to that answer. The first part is, of course, wherever there's totality. Nothing compares to the experience of looking in the sky where the sun should be and seeing a void, seeing the corona, solar flares arcing off the surface with the naked eye, staring around you at a 360 degree sunset as the moon's shadow passes over you. It is ethereal, it is unnatural, it is incredible. But I was also very lucky. The weather in Maine that day was some of the nicest it's ever been in spring. I could easily have flown two and a half thousand miles to go and stand under some overcast clouds and have it go dark for a bit. And so I think that's where the second part of my answer comes in. Because whenever I go somewhere that is unique or spectacular, I always combine it with something more mundane, more regular, because I find often those are the times I remember. One particular one that comes to me is, I went to see the Grand Canyon, and the Grand Canyon is spectacular. It is as good as everyone says it is. But that's not the memory I have that's strongest from that trip. That memory is going to a canyon around an hour away from the Grand Canyon, a little bit smaller, but I pulled into an empty car park. I walked up to the edge of that canyon and just sat there for a quarter of an hour. I listened to the birds screeching and echoing off the walls below me, the river thundering at the base of the canyon. And that is my strongest memory, a place that no tourist was when I was there in arguably peak season. Because I think in some ways, what appeals to me about travel is not just experiencing the unique, the singular, the special, it is seeing the world through the eyes of others, seeing the normal landscapes, going to places that are just what people are used to when they live around there. There are loads of canyons in that part of the world, and yet my time in that one canyon was what I remember. Similarly, there are loads of places I could have seen the eclipse, but my trip 
to Holton, to Bangor, to Acadia, meeting all the locals, that was special. It is that ability to go see the world through the eyes of others, to take the train to the end of the line, to go to a local market and eat a random dish, to just sit in a park and talk to people, that is what I value about travel. And it's that combination of the unique and the mundane that I think makes for a great place. And I think that is my answer for what the best place is to go see an eclipse. Thanks for watching. As you can see, I'm now definitely not in Maine. I'm in fact in the High Plains in Colorado. I'm here filming for a new mini series I'm doing, asking stupid questions about nature, the environment, travel, society, and hopefully finding some stupid and some less stupid answers. So if you're interested in that, do give the channel a subscribe or follow me on social media. But either way, it's been a pleasure having you for this video and I'll see you around. Until next time.